dad was a dissident. He was against the government. He got jailed a couple times. Um, so he really had to get out of Cuba or else, you know, never know what they were going to do, whether put him in jail forever, or shoot him on a firing squad. I had an uncle, unfortunately, that was shot five weeks after Castro took over on February 6th in a firing squad, 1959. Um, so we were clearly against the family was before I was born against the Castro dictatorship. And I mentioned this because one of the things that I know the Trump administration was able to do in the last presidential election was kind of somehow paint the Democrats as, as socialists and as maybe even Marxists. You know, those words get out there. I know it doesn't mean we are Marxists. I don't think Trump really even knows what Marxist means, but they they did that. And I think they did a pretty good job of labeling Biden and all the Democrats as socialists, at least in South Florida, where there are so many people that hate the word. Um, you know, a lot of the Cuban communities that way, a lot of the Venezuelan communities that way, uh, people ne leaving Nicaragua, just so many people who fled uh, dictatorial regimes. They don't like to even hear that somebody might be leaning to the left and and Marxists or socialists, they immediately turn away from them. But one of the things that I want to make clear, and I've been talking about a lot, and I hope it gets through to the, the voters, is that my family is extremely anti-communist. Um, I have fought thousands of cases in the courts, political asylum cases, on behalf of people fleeing um, true Marxist regimes, people fleeing dictatorial regimes, and I've been fighting those cases since the late 80s. I started doing political asylum and other type of immigration work. And I really like the work because you help people flee these dictatorships and, and live in America, you know, with, with some uh, sense of hope. And um, my opponent, um, hopefully if I win the Democratic nomination, it'll be Rubio. And Rubio, honestly, for those of you who don't know, paints himself out to be this anti-communist um, and really, it's more talk than anything. His father did not flee communist Cuba. His father came to the United States like in 57, 56, a few years before Castro even took over. Um, he had to correct his story when he ran for president because he used to say that his father fled communism. And when somebody dug out the research, he had to correct it and he had to change his website and clarify what had actually happened. So. I'm ready to debate him at any point about uh, what's best for the future of Florida and the country, but specifically talk about and, and, and be able to fight back on any claims about Marxism. Um, I think they'll, they'll try to play it. I know he recently wrote an op-ed that we're responding to. It came out a few days ago where, again, he says corporate America is 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 uh, becoming woke with Marxism. It was just ridiculous. It doesn't even make sense, the article, but um, I I'm going to attack it. It's just something that he does. Um, and I get it. He just tries to scare people. Um, so, yeah, that's how I was raised. I was raised very political at home in New York. Uh, my dad had a bodega, uh, so we used to run around the city a lot. Had he, Then he had a laundromat in, in, in the Bronx, um, and, and the bodega was in Spanish Harlem where we, where we grew up. Now the city was tough during that time. I mean, it, it is now too, but there were, there was a lot of like gang violence and things. And dad wanted to get out of New York and, and he, we moved down to South Florida in the early seventies and, and he bought a, um, a kosher bakery in Miami beach. Um, if you know, Washington Avenue, it's right on Washington off Española way, a nice little area. He kind of. I guess he saw the growth of South Beach before a lot of people did. It was the early 70s, and it wasn't. It, it really started taking off in the late 80s. So we grew up working there at the bakery with him, me and my brothers, um, and and you know enjoyed the work. But at some point, decided we're not going to wake up every day at four in the morning and take over the bakery. So we studied. <laughs> you know, my older brother went to med school, and I I went to law school up in Georgetown, and um. I really enjoyed the experience up in D.C., uh, came back down in the late 80s. And as I've said, started representing um, Haitian boat people in the late 80s. I worked with the Haitian Refugee Center 
uh, back then. It was fascinating work. Um, they threw us into the fire, you know, uh, it, it, that's the way I look at it because at the time the Haitians were probably the most marginalized group in South Florida. I, I really didn't realize it, but now that I look back in the late eighties, they really hadn't established any political presence yet. Um, many of the boats, if you'll remember, if you've been around Florida a while, you, you'll remember the boats, capsized boats with Haitians floating up to the beaches sometimes. You know, literally, there were some of those cases where it happened to 70 or 80 people. You know, it was, it was devastating to see. Um, and I gravitated towards the Haitian community and, and thought, you know, I've always liked to represent um, people in, you know, in those situations, those who really don't have a voice. Um, and got involved and, and really enjoyed it and did some really tough uh, work against the government. We didn't just represent people in court, but we also litigated class action lawsuits against the government uh, for Mexican and Haitian farm workers. We had a great victory for about 20,000 of them in, in late 88. Um, so I continued learning to do that was great for me because I found um, a passion. You know, I'd lived in a refugee camp in the Philippines in 1984, where we received Vietnamese boat people at the camp. They'd come over in their little rickety boats and, and we would try to find the place for them to go to from the Philippines. It was a first asylum camp. And most of the people I think on, on this call will remember Vietnam. And that was after Vietnam, the people were fleeing uh, the war. And I, I was a Georgetown student representative over there. And, and uh, it opened me up, it opened my eyes up to the world, you know, the suffering. And and uh, so when I came back to the States, that was still a student. I, I got into the Georgetown Law Journal, Immigration Law Journal, and met a beautiful Filipino lady in D.C. Um, uh, we got married and moved down to South Florida. Our family is very multicultural. Um, me being, my friends say I'm a hyphenated candidate. I'm Cuban-American, Jewish, Catholic with a Filipino wife and, and family from all over the world. Um, that my wife is one of six women and they're all married to people literally from Italy to Haiti to Philippines to Vietnam from everywhere. So yeah, our, when there's parties at home, you, you wherever you're from, you're gonna be comfortable <laughs> at the party. You're not gonna feel left out at all. Um, so I'll wrap it up with, cause I know I wanna open it up to questions soon. I, I, I had the great opportunity in um, in the early 2000s while working on behalf of immigrants. Uh, I, I, I was working on a big case. It was a car boat that was coming up. I don't know if you remember, but about 10, 15 years ago, it got a lot of recognition at the time. Um, a few Cubans got a the 1957 Chevy and put it on pontoons so that it floated. And then they ingeniously made the engine. Instead of the engine moving tires, it actually moved propeller. And, the, and it, was, it became a boat. It was really amazing. They got caught on the high seas. Um, and I got asked to work on the case by somebody who had family on the boat. Um, I came into it. It got, it got very high profile stuff. And within a couple of days, the White House asked me if I wanted to go work with them, which was kind of interesting. Um, I told them I wanted to solve our case first, which we did. And my clients, I got them to Guantanamo. And, and then they moved to Costa Rica. And eventually now they're in the States. And I started the process of, you know, FBI background checks and all that. And I was uh, uh, nominated to be special counsel for President Bush. I was a Republican before. Uh, I switched. Um, if anybody has questions, I'm more than happy to talk about it. I switched during the Obama's time. I realized I... I was losing, the party was losing me. I, it was going way too much to the right. And I could not continue to be an immigration lawyer and honest to my values and stay in the party. So I, I left. Um, and uh, I've been practicing ever since. You know, I've traveled the country. When I worked with the Bush administration, I was also an advisor to Obama. Um, I enjoy working with the federal government. And this time around, I helped um, the Biden administration uh, we represent a coalition of about 15,000 churches, and we came out in support of the Biden administration. And, and that's when I started thinking about maybe getting involved in politics again. And, and then January 6th was the icing on the cake for me. It just like 
you know, we're still watching now the investigations and, you know, and I talked to my kids and other people about it. I've got a great, great group of interns, like 15 young interns from the ages of 17 to about 25 that have joined the campaign. They're with us every day, you know, um, devoting time. And there are, uh, there are a couple from the Tampa area uh, that join us, you know, through Zoom. There's a number in D.C. and here in South Florida. I, I'm really I feel great with the turnout that we're getting um, from young people. Um, so my main issues are, are, you could see them on my website, but I definitely, I'm gonna push real hard for universal healthcare. Um, I think it should be done through Medicare for all, but however it is, I think everybody in America should have right to richest country, most powerful country in the world. Everyone should have access to healthcare, whether they have money or not. Um, I'm gonna push hard for that. I, I definitely think we need gun reform, especially in the form of very stringent background checks. I think well, there's too many of these assault weapons on the streets. The Brady bill had helped with that a few years ago. I think we have to bring in tougher laws. Um, I'm big on immigration reform. Uh, the difference of what I'm proposing on immigration reform, having been in the arena for over 30 years, it's, it's very simple. Um, the real issue is not so much the people crossing the border because that's the drama of immigration. You know, there's a few hundred thousand people across the border every month. And that just happens. And, you know, we have to receive them, interview them and make the decision what we're going to do with them. We can't just send them back immediately without an interview, at least, which was tr what Trump was doing. So Biden opened that up again, thank God, where everybody gets interviewed and they make a decision whether they're going to let you come in with your family or not. So that's part of the issue. But the bigger immigration issue is the 12 to 15 million undocumented people in the country. They're here. They're not going anywhere. They're not going to all be deported. Um, it's just it, it, it won't happen. Um, there's too many of them. And I suggest give them all a work permit. Simple. Nobody talks about it. I don't know why. But the truth is they need a work permit so they can get their Social Security cards and they can pay taxes. And we'll get tens of billions of dollars in taxes from them because they're working anyway, so we might as well get taxes. Now, if they do well, then they'll get a green card. Um, and if they do well for another few years after that, they'll get a passport. But start with a work permit and give them a chance to pay back. And it'll solve a big part of our immigration problem in the country right now. Um, you know, other than that, I'm very much for uh, women's right to choose, uh, protecting the LGBTQ community. Um, a lot of family that lives in that community, and I I think during the Trump administration, we took steps back in, in kind of demonizing, not just them, but other minorities and marginalized people. So I'm ready to take the fight on. I, As I like to tell people, we've been doing this kind of work all our lives, not just actually doing it for the whole state of Florida rather than just our clients who come to see us. So I, I, really, I really want to help make Florida and America a better country than the one that I was raised in. And I don't think we were headed in that direction um, in the last four years. Uh, so I do, I wanna make it better for my, my granddaughter who's four years old that I love. And I wanna protect the democracy that too many people lately really don't care about. You know, they're letting, you know, there's been a tax on it. You know, when does a, when does a, a president of the United States encourage uh, a mob to attack Congress. That just doesn't happen in America, but it did earlier in the year. We can't allow those things to continue to happen. So I'm ready to fight the fight and and that's it. <laughs> I'm gonna start with a couple of questions and then open to everyone, okay? Okay. Um, well, my first question is, you have issues, an issues tab on your website. Imagine that. Uh, incredibly enough, this is rare. Your main primary opponent, Val Demings, for example, has on her website a place to donate money and a place to sign up to volunteer and no issues. And that's it. And From that's the it. beginning of when so she started her website. Yeah. yeah. And I am a voter who gets very turned off by that. You not only have an issues tab, but you also wrote quite a bit on each of the issues that you listed on this in this order. Green New Deal, Medicare for all, universal education, immigration reform, affordable housing and tenants' rights, banking for all, defending workers, 
those are just the seven first issues that you wrote about as being your platform. Do you consider yourself a progressive? I don't like labels, to be honest with you. You know, um, I, you, I am definitely leaning progressive, um, I, but I think sometimes when you just say you're something, automatically a lot of voters won't even look at your issues. You know, I like to think more along the lines of like, I'm a new Democrat where here are the things that matter. Yeah, and you could say, yeah, I'm progressive. Um, but I think that hurts us sometimes as Democrats um, because they're, again, the other side tends to say, oh, you're all progressive. You're kind of like socialists. And I don't want that to happen um, just because of a title. Now I will clearly, as you could tell, I mean, I'm, I'm clear on where I stand on the issues and anybody who's progressive is probably going to agree with 90% of the stuff that, that we write. Um, so you could say I'm progressive, but one of, that's one of the things we're debating in the, in the campaign, just so you'll know. Um, a lot of people from around the country that are involved too in, in giving us ideas. And, and one of the things I'm getting pushback on is that, do we take a title on as I'm progressive? You know, So I'm telling you yes, but I don't want to be put into a box. Does that make sense? Because there's a lot of prejudice against it. Like there is... Uh to communism. So for example, you were citing some communist dictatorships. I come from Brazil from a capitalist dictatorship, yes. uh, not nowadays, but doing medicine and 20, for 20 years. And uh, as you were citing, uh, someone in your family came, Fleen yeah, Batista, which is- No, Fleen Castro, Fleen Castro. Right, but you also cited, I think it was Rubio that you cited, that was Fleen Batista, which was also yeah. a capitalist dictatorship. So people yeah. need to understand that dictatorships happen both in communism and Absolutely. in capitalism. And there are sometimes these systems that don't, uh, they are not dictatorial. Uh, but, okay, so- Understanding a little bit where you are in terms of this prejudice against the word progressive, do you plan to seek for an endorsement from our revolution? Yes. I'm on with our revolution all the time in, in uh, you know, different events and I'm, they follow me on Twitter <laughs> and I follow them and all that kind of good stuff. But yeah, I'm, I'm very much in, in line with our revolution. MoveOn.org are, you know, those are groups that I think are helping you know, change the country and move it forward. So yes, I'm definitely gonna hope, I hope to get, I know they're not gonna, they're not gonna support um, Val Demings um, because she's pretty centrist and establishment as far as I, I know. And I'm glad you pointed that out that I get emails from her all the time asking for money. And then I go to the website and I find out there's no, she's not standing for anything. It's just, I'm Val Deming, send me money. And I don't think that's right. I think we should know what she stands for. But again, a lot of the population, the voters don't care about reading up on the issues, but I'm glad you brought it up because it, it's extremely important for me, for people to know where I stand. As a lawyer, you know, words are important, obviously, uh, um, and positions are important. And I want people to know uh, what I'm hoping to do. <laughs> Thank you. And I have one more question before we open up to other questions. When I first met you, William, at the Hispanic Caucus Southwest chapter meeting, uh, then I asked you about what your position on the U.S. embargo against Cuba. And you said that you are in favor of lifting the embargo if the Cuban government holds free elections. On your website, though, you wrote that you support ending the sanctions on Cuba and Venezuela and you didn't condition that uh, to if they do that or if they do this. So which one is it? Are you supportive of the lifting of the embargo on, against Cuba, no matter how the Cuban government continues to handle itself? Or are you conditioning it? No. OK, I'm glad you noticed that. Boy, you're good. Um, I didn't remember exactly what I said, but I obviously have to remember now. I do remember now that you mentioned it, that I talked about the conditioning. My position is lift the sanctions. I would like to see something in return from Cuba, but I believe we need to lift the sanctions. That's, that's my position on it. Um, 
Would so, you pledge uh, as a candidate, as if you get elected uh, as my senator, would you pledge to fight for that? I pledge to fight for that. Okay. It's on my website. So, yes, I pledge to fight for that. And I know I'm going to get pushed back from some of the, you know, what I consider to be like dinosaurs in the Cuban American Republican community. I hate to say it that way, um, but because I have a lot of friends that are in that category, but it's definitely not what's needed for Cuba's future, for Venezuela's future. It keeps the people living in in dire poverty and it, it doesn't make sense. So yes, I pledge to fight for lifting of sanctions in Venezuela and Cuba. Great. So Manuel, do you want to read your question? Do you want me to read your question? I can read those questions to William. That's yes. not a problem. Hey, William, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming on. Uh, sure. Hi, Manuel. Participating with us. Uh, uh, what is your past experience running for office? Have you been elected in some other capacities through your no. career? This is the first time that you're running. The, okay. Um, specifically, 10 years ago in, in 2010, uh, shortly after Obama won, I did sign up to run for Congress, but it, it was a short-lived campaign. My, my children were all going into college, and I was focused on raising money for the campaign, and then I realized I was being disingenuous to myself. I I really had to make sure the kids got money to go to college and not my, I, I put my campaign off to the side. So after about three months, it was an exploratory committee and I closed it down. So that's when I signed up for it. But no, I've never held elected office. Now, when I worked in the Bush White House um, and was an advisor to Obama, was specifically in 2004, five and six, I was appointed by the White House and I was confirmed by the Senate unanimously to serve in that position. Okay. So even though it's not an elected position, it is um, a position in which I had to work within the political field in DC extensively. I had to get along with both sides of the aisle uh, since the work that we did, um, especially after 9-11 was so focused on protecting immigrants, those that were being demonized, like a lot of Muslims. And our office literally was in charge of prosecuting companies and individuals around the country that were discriminating against immigrants. So in that realm, I, I wouldn't say, no, I was not elected, but you could say that I was working in that field, but, okay. but it so, wasn't so. for, it wasn't really a position that was party based. It was more as a special counsel, just like Robert Mueller was a couple of years ago when, when he, when he tried to prosecute Trump. Okay. It, now, <clears throat> as I understand, you were born in Manhattan. You were not born in Cuba. No, my so, mom came seven months pregnant. Okay, but you were born here. So all you have heard from Cuba is through your parents and relatives that have related what happened and the oppression and what you have been able well, to read, but not you have not lived there. Never Cuba. Now, what? In addition to parents and family, I've I've had hundreds of clients that fled the dictatorship and I've represented it political asylum. So I, I've been hearing those stories, not just my parents' stories, because those are older. But for instance, right now I represent eight, eight um, dissidents that are in jails in Cuba right now. I, I, most of you will remember in July, there was a big uprising and people went out on the streets uh, 11th of July and over 500 people were jailed. And I represent a group called the Democracy Movement, Movimiento Democracia, in South Florida. And they asked me to lead the charge. So I started getting lawyers and we started representing the people that are jailed. And we're trying to get the OAS to go down there. But Cuba won't let the OAS go in. So, yeah, my experience with Cuba is not having lived there ever. Uh, uh, but through the eyes of family and clients. Yeah. OK. Now you're running against Marco Rubio. Am I correct? Yeah. So Marco Rubio is a very well known in politics all across the United States. So yeah. What will be your basic strategy that you plan uh, against him that you think will be successful and that you will be able to uh, win the election? Sure. Um, yeah, like, thank you for the question. First of all, 
it's important for any candidate, I think, to do some branding. And by appearing in these events, like this one, and I have two or three every week around the state of Florida, I have them with uh, Hispanic Democrats, I have them with uh, Move On folks, I have them with Florida Rising, um, on Zoom all the time, it seems. Uh, and then I'm going to be traveling around the state in January. And I think that after just a short half hour, 45 minutes with a group of people that are interested like you all and they're active Democrats, I think you can have a good idea of what I actually stand for um, after listening to me for a while. But that's hard to get, you know, a million, two million Floridians to get it because you have to raise a lot of money and do ads, which I'm raising some money, not nearly as much as Val Demings, but we're, we're at a few couple hundred thousand now and and we're making a big push to get to a million, hopefully in the next, by the next um, quarter. What I'd like to do in order to beat Rubio is just to let people know who I am, mm -hmm. honestly, okay? Because yes, Rubio is well known around the country, but he's very disliked even by some Republicans. And I, we do, um, we do um, polls and he's not the most favored senator in Florida. He really isn't. And I think people want to change. Even if it was not me, I think people want a change there because he's been there for 11 years. And he actually, I have asked thousands of people, what is one thing he has done for Florida? I, I haven't gotten an answer yet, Manuel. Just one thing that he's done for Florida. He's done a great job of promoting himself and becoming popular and running for president, but actually finishing something concrete for Florida, I I can't think of anything and, and I haven't, if you all can come up with it, let me know. So what I hope to do is let people know who I really am, what we stand for, which is universal health care, immigration reform, gun reform, all those issues, New Deal. The environment is huge for me. I know you all have a big issue there with um, Piney Point and Unfortunately, when the building fell in Miami Beach, I had an aunt and an uncle in the building, and I think um, it was devastating. It was really unbelievable what happened. Um, but as we started looking into it, a lot of the problem behind the building going down had to do with the water seeping in, coastal erosion. Mm -hmm. I mean, for 25 years, the salt water was going into the basement of the building and sitting there for like a, two weeks at a time. So it eroded the, the wall, the, the concrete the the part. And so I'm very much into, you know, protecting the environment um, for those reasons. So I hope I gave you an answer on how I yes. plan to one, be. One thing, William, I think your ideas, I don't know if they are exactly the same, but they are very much uh, uh, follow the same trend like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez with the Green Deal and the things that you are looking into. Maybe she's a little bit even more deep into that. And she is. I, I think she is, but I'm not patterning my campaign I'm after. Not, I'm not trying to compare you with her at all, but Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, eight years ago, maybe less than eight years ago, she was not known. She was not in the, the political scene. So what I will think is maybe uh, the grassroots movement that she was able to build on is what made her be where she is now. Because I now agree. You, name, you name her and everybody knows who is I agree. Yeah. This. So maybe uh, your and her strategy, I don't think she had millions and millions of dollars to put into this campaign that she organized. No, she didn't. You're right. So maybe we'll be copying the ideas that she put together to launch herself into the political scene in America. And where she was able to be successful with her ideas, some people call them their extremists, some people doesn't like her, but I think her ideas resound with the base of America. What yeah, I agree. Going through. So and, and maybe some of that, can be taken advantage of in the sense that you can re replicate what she was able to do and maybe become successful and known across the state of Florida for this political campaign you are going to be facing in 10 months, yeah. if I'm not incorrect. 
Yeah, I am moving as grassroots as possible. Yes, I, I appreciate you saying that. It is hers is a very good model, no question about it. I'm different, but yes, yeah, I'm very committed to grassroots campaign. Absolutely, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Johannes. Well, I really appreciate who you are and how you speak. Um, and I want to build on Manuel's question and your emphasis on grassroots. Uh, so question number one is, how do you plan to get funding for your campaign? How, how are you going about that? Who would you accept as funder and who would you, would you limit contributions in a, in a certain yes. way? The second question is assuming you'll make it, um, the, the big policy issue probably for you too will be immigration, uh, immigration policies. Um, this is an issue that has forced Democrats to twist into knots to get anything passed. Um, how would you go about getting something meaningful in terms of path to citizenship through Congress? How, how would you go about that? Can you sure. share a bit about your, your tactical approach to this? Sure, I appreciate it, Johannes. Great questions. Uh, very smart group here. Um, at the first, um, I'm sending out emails. Uh, we sent out 10,000 emails yesterday. We're gonna be sending thousands, tens of thousands of emails every week to people all around Florida to let them know who we are. And then at the same time, ask for a small donation. So through emails, through calls, there's call time, through uh, fundraisers, we've had a number of fundraisers and we plan to have many more. That's how we're starting to raise money. And we are getting, it, it, I'm really surprised that we get a lot of the five, 25, $50 donations from people around the country. So I hope at some point we'll be able to build that type of AOC, Bernie grassroots movement that you know, that relies more on a million people giving us 20 bucks than, you know, than a bunch of millionaires giving us a lot of money. I, I, I don't mind. I have friends who are millionaires, but I don't want money from, I don't want to be beholden to any particular group. I never have my whole life. I've always fought for, as you could tell now, marginalized people and people, you know, who, who don't have a whole lot of money. And I enjoy it because I feel like I'm really helping them get out of the situation that they're in and become immigrants. So I don't want money from NRA. I don't want money from big pharma. Uh, I don't want money from big banks either. I'm not, I'm not going to take it. Um, and, and I'm, and we're trying to build a grassroots movement. So that's where the funding is starting to come from and hopefully it'll continue to come. And as far as the, the immigration question, I, I did work extensively on it when I was in DC in 2004, five and six, as a matter of fact, we as immigration lawyers started working on DACA, the Dreamers, who you all probably don't know, in the early 90s. Um, the Dreamers were uh, a class, a group of people that we identified in the early 90s as being people that had to be protected, that we could not deport, they were too young. So since the early 90s, we've been trying to get the Dreamers some type of classification. Um, when it came around to Obama becoming president, I do know some of the people who work with Obama right now and the Domestic Policy Council uh, that are immigration lawyers, they know the issue very well, that are working with Biden now, but they also worked with Obama before. Um, and I know that they educated him on, on the issue of the Dreamers and he helped pass that executive order, um, which I think is great. Uh, now, path to citizenship, I think one of the keys to getting a path to citizenship done is making it simple for Americans to understand what we're going to do. When you talk about path to citizenship, they're confused. Most Americans have no idea what a green card is, what a work permit is. They have a, many of them don't even have passports because most Americans don't travel out of the country. So when you start talking about all these different paths and things, they get confused. I'm saying work permit. That's it. Work permit. I think the great majority of the people will agree that these millions who are in America should pay taxes. So I would frame it on that angle of work permit and tax paying. And then eventually it'll lead to a path to citizenship. But if we could get some legislation that allows them 
to apply for a work permit because they've been here for a certain period of time and they're not criminals, I think that eventually takes us to the path to citizenship. That's what I would push for. And of course, you've got to build a strong coalition in the Senate and in the House. And we're getting there. Biden proposed a great bill, IMACT 2021. Um, but like you said, it's, it's hard to get past. So thanks. Louise, would you like to ask your question? Okay, the question was, of course, Val Demings will be your first opponent, uh, but not just her, there'll be a bunch of other Democrats, including yeah. Alan Grayson, you know, people who have lots of name recognition. So, you know, could you talk a little bit about how you would plan to take them on uh, just, you know, among the Democrats? Sure. Um, great question. It is a strong field. Um, the short time we've been in it, um, I'm getting support from some, a lot of the organizations aren't yet uh, saying they endorse candidates because there's still a lot of time left. Um, but I'm feeling as if I'm getting a lot of support by engagement with them on groups like Move On and, and Our Revolution. I think they're gonna be important to, to help us get name recognition. Um, and again, Grayson does have a name uh, as a former congressman. And there's also Ken Russell from Miami, who's a councilman, a bright guy. I was on a little semi-debate with him the other day. And, um, and Val Demings, of course. I, I feel as though if I'm able to get heard, which through the world of Zoom and through traveling, I'm, I'm going to do a tour throughout the state in January, like going in an RV and, you know, and stop in little towns and really shake hands. I think through that and the grassroots effort we're doing now with emails and, and texting and, and, you know, posting, and we got like 10,000 followers on Instagram now. So we're getting a lot of people to follow us there and Twitter and Facebook are growing. So it, it, it's, our plan is to do that, to do our best to, to reach um, the people who are going to vote. Uh, it's not easy to establish a brand in a, in a market like ours where you're getting bombarded with news from all different sides and all different areas. But I think we're getting there. I think by June or July of next year, will most of the voters, because you know, only about 1.8 million people voted in the last midterm uh, for, the, for, for the Democrats, only 1.8, which means I can win with 900,000 votes. That's not a whole lot of people. I thought when I first started researching it, it was going to be four or five million. Yes, to win the election, um, we would need four or five million. But there were only 1.8 million that voted in the midterms in 2018 that were Democrats. So I think I'll be able to reach that population and, and get them to get to know us. And I think once they get to know us, I think they'll vote for us. Okay, thank you. And Matthew Montavon, you also have a question. Do you want to say your question? I love your values and they're very democratic values and uh, I commend you for, for your campaign. Uh, but you have to appeal also to those middle of the roaders and Republicans and independents. And uh, Republicans hate immigration at the moment. It seems like that's their big concern. Uh, whatever else is going on, climate change or or the economy, that you know the, the recent polls have put immigration as their biggest concern. There's a lot of, of uh, uh, racism involved in that. And oh yeah. Oh of, yeah. Uh, of uh, discrimination involved in that. But how do you address that? You know, you're coming coming out, and I I I love your as I say, I love your values on immigration. But mm -hmm. how do you sell those to? Another, that other constituency, because you'll need more than Democrats to win the election. Sure, great question. And yes, um, I think Trump demonized the immigrants and and made it a hot button issue. It is one of the biggest issues that they vote on now. Um, what I plan on doing is talking more about the American dream when I'm out there. Um, immigrants that, like all of us, uh, our parents, grandparents, great grandparents, ancestors came from another country. I made it here. I, I plan on talking about the the immigrants just recently that won the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, and they were and they're immigrants. Um, and 
as I said earlier, and I'll keep on harping on it, um, it's going to make sense for people to contribute billions of dollars to our tax base. And the immigration question hasn't been framed in that fashion. I'm going to try to frame it more in that it's a win-win. And I think Republicans, when they hear enough of it, will get the message that these people are here. There are about 15 million of them. If they pay taxes, it's going to be tens of billions of dollars every year. And then we'll be able to find out who the bad guys are. Because when they get their work permits, we'll be able to do background checks. In the meantime, we're not doing background checks. And, and yeah, a, a small percentage of criminals and they're running around and, and nobody's checking them out until they get caught. So if we ask those people to come forward and just get a work permit, we're not, you're not going to stay here for the rest of your life. You're getting a work permit. You're going to pay taxes. I think that's a good beginning with the Republicans um, so that they'll get it. And, and you'll probably remember um, George W. Bush was, was big on some type of immigration reform, as was McCain. Uh, rest and may rest in peace. So there are Republicans out there that do see the the importance of immigration in this country. So I'm glad you pointed it out. Though it is going to be a hot button issue, and, and but I'm you know I'm going to stick to um, stick to that message. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I can I add something? Um... No, no. <laughs> If I'm a politician, I have to say yes to everything. Yes. Definitely. And that's what I was going to say. I mean, rather than pointing out the differences between Republicans and Democrats, I think what you should do is try to deal with the humanity of us all. Okay. That poor lady that her son cannot find uh, enough medicines. It doesn't matter if she's Republican or Democrat. Okay. We want to help her. We want to bring them out of the hole. And I don't care if they're from Cuba or from Washington State, they're all here. So I think the idea of the American dream is really important, but okay. without going to the American dream business, because that's been used so many times that you know it becomes a little bit- uh, yeah, that, yeah, that story, yeah, I get it, yeah. yeah. And the beauty of Ocasio was that she, she told you as it is, you know, people came after her. She just turned around and she, she made room for herself in a room full of men, you know, with the suits and everything. She came and she told them what to do. So this is where you are going to have to deal with Rubio, who is a little puppet. And right. you're going to have to show that he's a puppet. Everybody knows it, but you just have to tell him, to his face and make him back off, you know, because that's what he has to do. He has to back off. He thinks it's God's given to Florida and he's a real idiot. But anyway, <laughs> that's the kind of thing that you want to do. Just bring okay. them out and, you know, don't mince your words. The problem with Democrats is they're too nice. No, I'm not. I'm, I, it, it sounds like you've been reading some of our posts because I've been no, getting tough lately. Ready. Some of the posts lately are like, hey, hey, Marco, I'm ready to take you on, you know, basketball court and immigration court anywhere. Let's do this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm willing. I appreciate that because I I think that needs to be done. And he is. He's he's Trump's puppet. He He's his yes man. And I think a lot of people recognize that. So I'm going to be attacking that. Thanks. To follow up on that line of questioning about uh, broad-based appeal, have you identified some of those broad-based bread and butter issues that affect all Floridians? I mean, I know there's problems with uh, uh, affordable housing, for instance, or uh, we have a large senior citizen uh, population. Uh, so, you know, not all campaigns have to be based on, on fear or, or negativism. But, I, you know, one of the issues, have you identified those that would appeal to people from Florida, not even nationally so much, but from, for actually from Florida? Yeah, I, I, thanks. Great question. Um, and uh, Mika, I think, was alluding earlier to our points. Obviously, we can't focus on 15 different points when we have a short debate or when you're able to go on TV or on the radio for a little while. So. I try to focus on the issues that matter most to Florida. And I think you're absolutely right. Um, 
housing I haven't spoken about in this conversation, but it is a big part of my platform. And I think it is a big part that something is very important to Americans right now and, and Floridians specifically is um, having affordable housing because it's really getting out of hand all around the state. And as far as senior citizens, yes, I'm actually going to be campaigning with a group uh, that's called the United States Global Leadership Council. And they're, they include all of our secretaries of state. They reached out to me, which I really was honored by it. And they're gonna be doing events with veterans uh, all around the state of Florida. And they've asked me to join them. Um, so we are gonna be identifying there what's most important to the senior citizens. And I think one of the biggest issues for senior citizens is that we protect social security. I mean, a lot of the, there's groups that wanna pri privatize it. And if you put it in the hands of Wall Street, <laughs> you never know what's, what could happen to social security. Um, so yes, I, I appreciate that. And environment, I think is a big issue for Florida right now too. Would you like to close with some words, say something before you go? I, you know, yeah, I, boy, if I could get engaged uh, voters like you all um, every week, man, it made a, it make a huge difference in our campaign. Unfortunately, there aren't, you gotta find them, the people who really wanna stay involved and wanna make a difference in the state of Florida. And, you know, in groups like yours, are really important, you know, for our democracy. So I thank you more than anything. I hope I'll be able to represent you next year in the Senate and, and, and I'll make you all proud. As my son said yesterday, dad, is that what I'm gonna end with this? He's watching Ruby on TV for a moment. Ruby was talking about something about Marxism and communism and, and he gets off and he says, dad, you know what? My, my son's 35, he has a baby now. He's kind of grown up, but he's a great kid. You know, I see, Rubio on TV, and you know, I just thought of something. I bet that in one year, our law office helps more people in a year than Rubio has helped in his 10 years in, in office. And I was like, wow, that was a hell of a compliment. But I honestly think it's true. I think that Rubio is the type that just makes promises, but isn't really providing any concrete solutions. And, and I think we'll be able to do that. So I hope I can earn your vote. Thanks. And I want to thank you very much for taking your time and this wonderful discussion we've had here. And uh, if you want to visit his website, it's Sanchez with a Z, SanchezForSenate.com. And you can learn a lot more about the issues. He's got quite some write-ups there. And you can also donate for him if you wish. And if you also have other organizations, other groups of people that you would like to invite Will to speak, I'm sure that he yeah, would that'd be great. That. I, I, I just wanted to let people know, so I said I was a physician, but part of my work as a physician was I did migrant health uh, in New York State, and I also worked for Doctors of the World, which was to uh, find, to, uh, examine people who were seeking asylum um, as a physician and af writing an affidavit for them. So I'm, I'm uh, quite familiar with some of the immigration policies or, or, and dysfunction of, of the United States. And, I was interested in, in Will's comments about that and also how he would approach it with, uh, as other people asked about with the Republicans coming as just the fear about these people, which is uh, something to overcome because that fear is, is not founded. Plus everybody's looking for workers and yet we have workers readily available for them if they would just let them work. Thank you for that comment.